Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Christ Church for this memorial service for Margaret Clark. It is a memorial service. We had a committal of her body for cremation with the close family on Thursday afternoon, so that's why we don't have the coffin here. And uh, I want to just express our sympathy and our love to Donald, Michael, Carolyn, and Heather, and to all the seven grandchildren and the extended family, we do pray that as you remember Margaret, you would be comforted and strengthened and encouraged by the great love of God. So just a few sentences of scripture to direct our service. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me, shall never die. The Apostle Paul wrote, I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else, else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, so it will be for those who died as Christians, God will bring them to life with Jesus. Thus we shall always be with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. So let's bow our heads for a brief prayer. Heavenly Father, in your Son Jesus Christ, you have given us a true faith and a sure hope. Help us to live as those who believe in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection to eternal life, and strengthen this faith and hope in us all the days of our life. Through the love of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Now we're going to sing our first hymn. On dear Lord and Father of mankind, kind, forgive our foolish ways. We stand to sin. <laughs>
So we're going to have the tributes now from Carolyn, then Jean, Jean Petri, and Moa, and Eva. Our mother, Margaret Lynn, was the third of three children. Um, unfortunately, her only surviving brother, Connell, is in the UK at the moment, was unable to join us. But we thank him for sending some memories of Margaret and also for, for writing these beautiful flowers at the frontier. So this is a tribute from my uncle, Connell. I'd like to share with you a few shards of memory about Margaret's early years. But first, let me contribute to today's celebration of her life in my own words. Even though our paths divided in later years, I will always remember Margaret as a lovely person, gentle in nature, dearly loved as a mother, and my little sister. A strong and enduring Christian faith and a love of music were hallmarks of her life. I say little sister because there was a gap of six years and seven years respectively between Margaret, myself and our brother John. We were always known separately as the boys and Margaret. Flashes of memory from our early years together remain, but many details seem to have fallen through that age gap. We were living in Somerset East when our sister was born, a farming town nestling on, under Bosberg, the mountain that our father later taught us to climb. He was the English master at Guild College and our house was directly opposite. I have a memory from that time when Margaret was three, or was it four, when I was allowed to take her to the nearby park, a green oasis amid the dusty roads. We were both enthralled by the giant tortoises and cage full of vivid monkeys. A good visit, but I was later teased by my classmates at school. Local lads were interested in manly pursuits like bok bok, touch rugby, and the swimming pool. Walking hand in hand with one's little sister was definitely considered beneath one. Dad's mother, whom we call Miffy, my mother's grandmother, lived within walking distance. She loved children and provided a good source of homemade fudge, coconut ice, and occasionally spring buck biltong, which only she could make. This happened when a farmer's son passed his matric, English matric against all expectation and the farmer thanked Dad with a whole springbok delivered to our front door by Bucky. Margaret loved Miffy and her favourite toy was Bonza, a stuffed velvet puppy that used to be Miffy's pincushion. Bonza went everywhere with her until the time when we went on holiday to East London by train. Halfway there, Margaret dropped Bunza out of the train window and there was no going back. She was inconsolable. In 1953, Dad took up the post of Head of English at Gray High School and as we moved from Somerset East to Port Elizabeth, thereby swapping simple, simple country pursuits like Sunday school picnics at Bester's Hook for the intricacies of city life, the sun and sea, and of course the wind of Port Elizabeth. John and I went to Gray and were soon absorbed into school life. Gray was like that, you became part of it. When Margaret reached school age, she went to Gray's equally traditional sister school, collegiate. I have this mental picture of her in a little blue, blue uniform, button down shoes and blonde hair peeking out under a wide brimmed hat. The school motto was facta non verba, deeds, not words. The school emphasized compassion and generosity of spirit, which I believed slowed in Margaret the seeds of service to others in which she lived. As Desmond Tutu later put it, do your little bit of good where you are. It's those little bits of good that overwhelm, overwhelm the world. It was in Port Elizabeth that Margaret's love of animals came through. We'd always had cats, and then a friend from school who kept and bred budgies offered me a little blue one whose tail feathers had been damaged in the nest. Mum okayed the price, so Margaret now had a budgie called Peter, who was sweet but couldn't fly. Peter was soon followed by Paul, and so her bird fancying days began. I said that Margaret was musical. She learned to play the piano at school, and fittingly it was music and the church that later brought her together with her husband-to-be, Humphrey. 
When she was a girl, her favorite singer by far was Julie Andrews. I never did ask whether she preferred the sound of music or Mary Poppins. I suspect the latter because the storyline was gentler. While Margaret was still at school, at school, John and I both studied at UCT and in both cases took scientific degrees. Well before that, in 1966, John and I were both happily married and in London together when we heard the sad news of our father's death. At the same time, Margaret was in a trip and about to write her final exams. I know she was distraught and I'm not sure if she ever really got over it, yet she still excelled in her exams despite the loss of our father. I suspect that their faith in God carried both Margaret and our mother through that difficult time. After school, Margaret followed my brother and I to UCT some six years later and characteristically chose humanities, not science. Graduating sociology and practicing social work in some of the roughest areas on the Cape Flats. I'm sure that other members of the family will speak and pay tribute to Margaret's later years, but I don't want to end on a sad note. Just to say that I asked my wife Lona what her best memory of the Margaret we knew. Without hesitation, she said, her wedding day. Margaret and Humphrey's wedding reception was held in the garden of our uncle Cyril and Aunt Stella's Pinelands home. All sunshine and green lawns and tables ringed by Cyril's dahlias. Lona said what a beautiful bride she was, radiant and all in white, in a colourful setting, a memory to treasure. In conclusion, I would like to underscore what I said before. Margaret was a lovely person, gentle in nature, deeply loved as a mother, and my little sister. I will miss her. Hi, good afternoon. Um, Margaret and I go back a long way. I first met Margaret when Humphrey brought her to the choir to join in um, when we all sang with Elsie Jennings in the 19, late 1960s, <laughs> going into the 1970s. Um, and I was at the wedding, which was wonderful. Um, but Humphrey taught Margaret to play the clarinet. And when I went to university, I also learned to play the clarinet. And so we had these evenings of music, three clarinetists in a tiny flat playing Humphrey's arrangements of all sorts of amazing music. Um, well, it was, I don't know what the neighbors thought, but anyway, it was a lot of fun um, and, and a very bonding time. Um, and then when Donald was born, they graciously asked me to be his godmother, which I did with, with great joy. Um, but then as the years went by, you know, we, I got married, moved to Zimbabwe, and Margaret and Humphrey's life has continued with their four children. I went, came back with children, so we didn't interlink in quite the same way. But, but they were stalwarts of the choir, those two, and um, they really shaped my life in many ways. Um, let me just see if I can get back to my notes because I'm so far off from them. <laughs> anyway, um, but, but Margaret was always so solid in her faith. Gent a gentle soul, a loving soul. She was always delighting in, in other people's joys too. Um, so she has a very special part in my heart. And over the last few years where life hasn't gone so smooth for her, she never, she never let it get her down. She said, that's, that's it, that's what God's like. He's got the answer. Um, and if the medical staff are taking too long, that's all part of God's plan. And she just accepted all that with her quiet trust. Um, and then in the choir, Margaret was the one who just loved singing. She loved singing, she loved singing. Descans, if there was a descans of him, she knew about it. She knew it and she knew exactly where we could find it. Um, and she would really encourage us. Um, so we had a mustache, um, all us sopranos. And, and I just must say I'm really grateful that I had her as a friend. That I've watched her through the hardships and the joys of life and she's just always been this peaceful calm person um, who brought joy thank you
I was just that half and I thought, I'd die to have a thing like that in my funeral. And then the church might have to. <laughs> <laughs> only a few weeks ago, sorry, good afternoon everyone. Um, only a few weeks ago at the 8am service, that process I noticed that Margaret Clark was not up front as part of the choir. And Margaret and I had once worked together up at the church offices up the road at the centre, so I, I look out for her and I, I noticed Margaret. Her function, as, as far as I was concerned, was as part of the body of Christ, was up there in the choir. So where was she? So after the service, I asked the font of all knowledge at Christ Church, Annie Bourne, who confirmed that Margaret wasn't well, that she'd been hospitalised, taken from her home. And then, it's funny how life draws these things together, but Carolyn um, is at a course which my wife and I are busy presenting at the moment, and a couple of days later, she dropped me a line asking me if I'd be prepared to say a few words here. And of course, Margaret had passed away, which is a great sadness for me. I, I, I've, I've, uh, I knew Margaret fairly well for a while, and it was, it was, it's been quite a strange journey over the years. Every time to look up and look at Margaret looking back at me and think, we shared certain memories together about running a, a particular part of uh, Christchurch's organisation. <laughs> I found myself sort of thinking about why is it that we miss people when they die? Well, for obvious reasons. I mean, we're sad that they've gone. We're not going to see them until you know we've gone through the same process that they have. But it's more practical things. There's a there's a kind of a loss of continuity. You know, you, you get used to seeing people up front, and and, and they become part of the, the sort of makeup of your life. But probably the saddest part of it all is the is the loss of the ability just to share memories with them. And um, I remember when my brother died, who also went to Gray, incidentally, so it was obviously fine that. Um, I, I remember that, that you know, just this inability, that he wasn't there for me to go and share things with. And uh, I remember Margaret and I quite often just chatting outside because she had this... Well, let me go back to my notes as well. Um, Margaret and I shared the challenges of reception. I thought I, I liked that line. Um, you know, when you when you do reception up at Christchurch, you get lots of folk coming off the street, and and um, and they're all they've got very sad stories. Ellie Bourne will tell you that that we try to give them personal attention, but most of the time the stories are strung out and they they they, they lead to one conclusion: the folk need money and or some kind of help. And Margaret and I would stand afterwards and, and chat about these things, but. I remember the way she started. She she used to come. She was, I think, uh, working as a volunteer. And and what she did, she used to come in that big. I brought this book along to remind me. She had that big VW. Do you remember? It was a sort of. It was. I had a VW Jetta as well, but it was like a square one. But hers wasn't square. It was like much bigger. And it was sort of this kind of colour. Do you remember? And and I think the end, it caught fire once. And old Philippe, who is our verger, was very good at sorting things out. He sorted that all out. Um, and then she bought a trusty white Hyundai Atos. That's right, there, yeah, that's what I was remembering. Good. And uh, it's quite a long time ago. And um, but she was so reliable. She used to come. A lot, she was. She was quite often used to come in early so that she could find things to do. And um, eventually, what happened was she became entrenched as our as our afternoon receptionist. Um, but most of all, as I was saying to Carolyn just as we came in, Margaret reminded me of my mother. She was kind of sort of. She was serious, and she was sort of old-worldy, and she had a smile like my mother, but most of all, she had a hairstyle like my mother. And in fact, I was looking at these pictures, there was one with very short hair, my mother never had very short hair, but most of the time, that sort of, that kind of stuff, my mother used to have. And I have to say, it consciously endured me to, to Margaret enormously. We got along very well. She kept the reception organized. I received messages from her, lots of messages. I'll get onto that in a second. And I had the sense that matters were well in hand. Depending on timing, she'd sometimes attend staff prayer and worship sessions, and I'm sure she enjoyed these with us. But Margaret was typically reserved, and she always had that slightly knowing look, like she knew something that she didn't know. Until she <laughs> um, time passed, at some point Margaret became ill and became evident that she could no longer manage the front desk, and she left us for treatment and convalescing, and our working arrangement ended. Looking back probably more than 13 years, that could well be the sum of my memories. But I'm going to share two humorous anecdotes which spoke to the Margaret most of us knew. The Margaret was quite strange. First, I remember, as I mentioned above, I received lots of messages from Margaret at reception. I should have noticed, but I, I wasn't particularly observant, so I didn't query why I was getting messages instead of the usual visits and calls. 
Now, memory of events, our memory of events is not absolutely crystal clear, Margaret, so forgive me if this is not absolutely perfectly right, but one day someone, I think it might even have been Sally Bingham, who's also passed on, so I can't ask her either, stuck her head into my office and said, was it okay for her to speak to me? And I said, sure, come in. And she said, oh, your secretary doesn't think you're able to see people this afternoon. And then the penny dropped, and, and Margaret and I had a little chat. And she said to me, you're far too busy just to see anyone anytime. <laughs> the murders that she'd taken to protecting me from the masses and, the de and deemed it better for continuity. If I phoned when it suited me, then I suffered the interruption of a visitor or a phone call, which I hadn't answered myself. So on the one hand, I wanted to applaud her consideration, but given that I had an open door policy and I was beginning to miss the popping visits from folk like Ken Clack and his whiskey jokes, I had to convince Margaret that it was more important to get the call or visit it to me than to protect me from them. She stood there nodding her head with that look that said, you're wrong, John, but I shall endeavor to please you. A much bigger effort on Margaret's part was the great photocopy exercise. Hands up if anybody knows what I'm talking about. Okay, yeah, good. <laughs> As a member of the choir, and now with access to this wonderful new Nokia which we just brought up the road, it would actually respond to voice instructions if you spoke right, just in the right voice. Margaret was at last able to pursue an ambition which must have been on her mind for many years. Members of the choir should each have their own copy of every hymn they might need to sing. Now think of Margaret and think about that task. This started innocently enough with requests from Richard Hagel, was it Eugene? Uh, to photocopy hymns from, for the choir on an as-required basis. But Margaret's desire to both be productive and proactive took this effort to new, unimagined heights. We began to notice that our photocopy usage was running way beyond budget. And then, as I recall, we were always running out of paper. And investigations led us to understand that Margaret was using photocopy a great deal, and no one knew why. Richard denied that he had given this Richard Haig, denied that he had given an excessive amount of work to copy, but then why was she doing so much of it? While we considered these things that emerged, Margaret was on, on the verge of collapse. She was completely overwhelmed. She confessed that she'd taken this task upon herself, uh, never considering that her own personality would drive her to seek out every hymn, song, chorus, or thing of praise ever produced in the history of mankind. <laughs> All for photocopying 30 times or so and filing and storing it. The task was never ending and she was trying to squeeze it into the hours she worked in an afternoon. She'd even begun working extra hours. <laughs> it was clear then that Margaret needs a break and she left us and so the great exercise ended. And Jean and others spent a lot of time thereafter trying to do something constructive with hundreds and hundreds of copies stored in every filing box which Margaret had filed. <laughs> the old cliche that those who died should rest in peace has always troubled me. Why? Imagine an eternity resting. God has things for us to do. Perhaps we can draw a little humor here. As we consider Margaret, now unquestionably in his divine presence, with the ambition to provide copies of every hymn or song of praise ever written or sung ever for the entire choir invisible, of which he surely be a part, and all of eternity to get it done. <laughs> Bless you, Margaret. Thank you for the joy you gave us, for the skills God gave you. Thank you for your indomitable spirit, and thank you for wearing your hair just as my mother did. <laughs> <laughs> John, thanks so much for bringing humour to today. I know today is a memorial service for my mom, but it's also a celebration of her life. Um, and it's great to be able to look back on the funny things that she did. I think you summed it up so perfectly with that story of her photocopying. <laughs> um, her house is a testament to that as well. <laughs> my, my mom was a very intelligent person and she loved people very deeply, especially her family. And she was also very proud of her autonomy, to the point where she would tell doctors what they wanted to hear, even when she was very sick. Um, just last week, Friday, I had her with Dr. Alan Barnard, who's a member of his congregation, and he says, you're looking well, Margaret, and she says, I'm fine, there's nothing wrong with me. <laughs> My mom was the most compliant and refused to admit to even herself that she wasn't well. She did live a difficult life with her neurodivergency, but she made an excellent mom. She made games out of nothing. She came up with a brilliant game such as Educational Grab, which my older sister was playing with her. I was too young, I was a bit left out of everything. Running family joke. 
They also played a game called Eggy where they would throw a ball up and just call random numbers and you the youngest also hit in the head of the ball all the time. Um, my mom's music was a massive part of our life. Was, both my parents were very musical and all four of us went on to at least two musical instruments. Um, and it was as a result of my mom's excellent motivation as, as we were growing up. She would bribe us, cajole us, plead with us and often reward us with jelly powder for our practices to get that music right. It helped us to achieve some very high standards of music in the Cape Town effort where we played against the Shepanoos and the Tags, a couple of families of, this, of the congregation to this day. And my mom's favourite word when someone was rubbish was rhubarb. her saying rhubarb when something is not right. And two things that sound my mom had very well were the church and her family were equally important to her. She's, I remember sitting in that bathroom down at the end when it was a tape recording studio when I was after school, bored out of my mind, having to sit and wait for her to record endless tapes. That's where it started, it's all the photocopy. <laughs> um, and she's left behind seven beautiful grandchildren. Um, and for her, for church, the Bible study group, the choir, and the service and working in church were huge. I remember part of the choir being dumped on the stage at whatever age, me, my turn, while we were while the choir got on with it. Apparently, I used to conduct. I think my brother was also. I just want to end with a few thank yous. Um, firstly, thank you to my mom's neighbours. Some of them are here today, and those that aren't. Please pass on my thank yous. You guys, we've had fantastic Fixing her gate when it won't work, stopping her car when it won't start, thinking that she's okay when she insisted on reversing down her long driveway, which took her two minutes to climb to her garage, despite her neighbour trying to offer to help drive it down for her. That was very recently, by the way. Um, I don't know he's not here. He was fantastic in. I actually brought my mom to him to bypass the military system because the military system is worse than the government hospitals, if you can imagine that. Um, just to try and get some progress on her treatment and find out what was happening there. And I went to another doctor at practice. Um, and I knew that Alan was a Christian. I thought he was at my church. Apparently he's here. I had no idea. But it was just so great because so, she saw a familiar face and he was able to just be like an old friend with her. It was really, really great. It was very sweet. Um, and he was the one who called when she passed. I apologize for a few people that I was just in a state. And lastly, to Liesl. You took my mom in. You looked after her. You loved her in the last week. So thank you for giving up your home, giving up your time, and just being there for her aunt. And, and to the, the grandkids who were there, Ruben and Nina, thank you for being there for her. And my heart feels so happy knowing that my mom wasn't alone in the last week. She wasn't at home, despite her fighting us. She wasn't alone at home. She was with family who loved her. And the moment of, of being moved into the home where she passed, I just want to end with a little testimony of how God has been so good in the last couple of months. We've a lot for her, not knowing what was wrong, and then finding out about the lymphoma. We turned to God, be merciful, be merciful for her. We didn't pray, Lord, heal her, or Lord, take her out, or whatever. God, in your infinite wisdom, be merciful. And I firmly believe every step of the way that came to the moment of my mom being where she was, my boss being with these, or God's miraculous plan for her. And he held her to her belief that God had her. He really, really did up until the last moment. God was with her. And that's such a testimony of his goodness in her life. She set such a sterling example of prayer and living life in the word. And I think we can celebrate that today, that my mom was at the very last moment. Thanks so much for giving me this opportunity to say a few words about Margaret and I speak on behalf of Our Lady's Bible Study. 
we saw a different side of Margaret to um, a lot of what has been spoken today. So let me tell you a bit more about Margaret and Mindstein. Margaret has been a member of our group for many decades. In fact, one of our group members, Heather, recalls that when she, that is Heather, joined us about 30 years ago, Margaret was already an integral part of the group. We studied the Bible together and support one another through all the ups and downs, starting off with having our own young families, progressing as teenagers, to marriages of our children, our grandchildren, to times of illness, the loss of sons for some of us, and so much more. Through all of this, we became close friends. And it has been so special to know when times were tough, friends who were praying for us, as well as celebrating good times with us. And we began to miss her presence in the group sorely. Sheila recounts that she first met Margaret and Humphrey about 40 years ago, when Sheila's daughter and Carolyn do duets together in the music aspect. Margaret loved her music and we've already heard how much she contributed to the music and the choir here at DCK. And I also enjoyed singing with her in the choir for many years. Margaret Lord, quiet yet firm in her faith. Gentle yet strong. She had a quirky sense of humour, which we all appreciated accompanied by a cheeky grin of amusement. She kind of smiled out of the side of her mouth. I'm sure it's so familiar to you. She was unassuming, committed to God, her loving Heavenly Father. And her spiritual contribution and wisdom were greatly appreciated in our group. She knew her limitations, and there were times when she faced various health challenges. And during those times, she was just very quiet in the group, just absorbing, listening, and not contributing. And just looking back over our prayers um, over the years, I see that we prayed with her through bouts of vertigo for over 10 years. So she had And then as her health improved after times of ill health, she would become more interactive in the group again. We have a policy of all sharing in leading the Bible studies. And when I asked for volunteers to lead, Margaret was very quick to speak, um, but to nominate somebody else to, <laughs> to lead the Bible study. Um, but she was also very happy to take her turn. As Sheila said, Margaret was a faithful, committed member of our Bible study group. With a sound knowledge of her Bible, she was always quick to refer us to relevant verses. She really knew and loved God's Word. Anthea said of Margaret, her faith was her rock, and her contributions were always meaningful and worthwhile. Gail said, Margaret was a beloved woman. She was wise beyond my field in her faith and knowledge. He loved her, and I'm devastated that she has gone. But I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that she is in Jesus' arms. It was a humble, undemanding woman who raised her family, and that's what in what others have shared. I think she thoroughly enjoyed all the places she did. In praying for her family, her faith was unwavering, and she had full confidence that God would answer her prayers. The way she prayed for her family was both a challenge and an encouragement to me. So to the family, no, mother prayed and prayed and prayed for you all these years. She will even back on our study group and we will miss her so much. 
but we are happy for her as she is whole and healthy again, having a marvelous time in the heavenly choir. To the family, we offer the deepest sympathy as you mourn her loss. May the Lord Jesus, Margaret's rock and her strength, be your rock and comfort at this time. And may your memories of encourage you to continue to follow the Lord just as she did. Thank you. So now we are privileged to enjoy two items in the hall. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. 
Thank you. We're going to have a reading now from John chapter 2. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And then Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not come yet. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars that were there for Jewish rites of purification each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. They said, and he said to them, Now draw some, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone who everyone serves the good wine first, and then when the people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother his, and his brothers and his disciples. They, and they stayed there for a few days. Well, I'm sure Margaret wouldn't be happy if we didn't look at the scriptures together. I'm going to stand, suggest you stand for a prayer because you've been sitting for a while. And we'll just pray together. Well, as we come to consider this passage together, we do so thanking you for Margaret's life. And we pray that you would help us to grasp and understand the significance of your word to us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please sit down. Let's to follow. After the opening stories about John the Baptist and the early disciples, the early followers of Jesus, the mystery in verse 11. Jesus did the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Now the word that John uses for clue is signs. This was the first of the signs that Jesus gave. These signs take us to the story, ultimate one. These signs of goodness, we have never been to the holy gods, bursts into the world. Which is a foretest as a platform for her heart.
It was made through him and for him. In chapter 2, Jesus attends a wedding in Cana of Galilee, joining in the celebration and affirming the goodness of creation, goodness of marriage, and God's involvement in every part of our lives. We've seen so much of a love for God in Margaret's life. God's creation is good. In Genesis 1, the climax of creation is actually the creation of human beings in the image of God. We're all created in the image of God. to God. Everyone is by God. We create to know and love God and to reveal God's character in the world around us. We thank God for Margaret. We thank God for all that her life has meant. For her 74 years of life, for many years in Cape, schooling at Collegiate where she became a prefect, and for the person that she became. The 35 years of marriage to Humphrey. I remember in the 1960s, the choir. She was always the one who kept them together and knew what they were amongst all of the family. We thank God for her love for music, which she shared with all of us. Her playing of the piano, playing of the clarinet in the orchestra. And she passed on her love of music to her children, no doubt a very noisy household. <laughs> But that must have been wonderful, everyone playing instruments. She graduated from UCT as a social worker, and she also worked here at Christchurch, as we've heard from John. Above all, we thank God for Margaret's love for Jesus, her commitment to the scriptures and to Christchurch and her family. We can say about Margaret, God's creation was good. We saw something of God's great love and goodness in Margaret's life. So first of all, creation, but secondly, new creation. John's Gospel is about the new creation that comes to the life, death, resurrection of Jesus. The original creation came through the of God. God said, and there was that. Now in the new creation, it comes once again through the word of God. And God's plan to bring all creation to harmony with Jesus, the made flesh. And this applies to creation and of course to all of us. We receive of God. So when we believe in Jesus, we become part of God's new creation. As Paul wrote in Corinthians 5, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Christ had experienced the reality of becoming a new person in Christ. And she to that in the way that she lived, in her love for the scriptures, her love for her family, and her love for Christ Church and the people here at Christ Church. Now, running out of water, running out of, water, running out of wine, it wasn't convenient. That's because the whole thing didn't come along. I don't really know. We see the story of Jesus is completely 
which will equal the meat. The water jars are a sign that God is doing a new thing from within the Jewish system, bringing purification to Israel and to the whole world. The translation of the Jesus has transforming water into the one, the man of the new creation. So we thank God for moments. The journey of faith, the letter to serve God in her work in the church, and especially through her love music. So creation, new creation, but lastly, resurrection. Now there's a clue in verse one of this passage that John is referring to the resurrection of Jesus. Verse 1 reads, on the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. So what is the third day? Well, the third day is, of course, the resurrection day. And there's a reference. Jesus rose from the dead on the third day. The third day is the beginning of God's new creation. The resurrection of Jesus is the heart of our faith. We wouldn't be here in church today if it wasn't for the resurrection. There wouldn't be a church. Corinthians 15. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruit of the fallen asleep. Jesus is the beginning of the resurrection. So we look forward to that when Jesus is revealed and the dead are raised, we will be raised from the dead. Margaret will be raised from the dead. Will be part of God's new creation. I know that Margaret's going to be in the choir in the new creation. But actually, you know, the Bible doesn't say a great deal about what happens if you after death, except that we know that we go to be with the Lord, in the conscious presence of the great love of God, and we look forward to the resurrection day, the day when creation is renewed. In harmony with God's perfect purposes, and we are part of the new creation with resurrection bodies and work. To do. We won't be just sitting around, we will have a part as those who are priests, as we're told in the scriptures, looking at God's world and serving one another and those around us. I'm sure there'll be lots of music. And Robert will be involved, no doubt. But that's the great hope of the resurrection. Creation, new creation, resurrection, creation. Isaiah says, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So, we thank God for Margaret and her life, for all that it's meant. The one and we thank God for the whole one through whom all are created, the beginning of the new creation, and the resurrection and the life. And we commend Margaret to God with grateful thanks. Amen. So I'm going to ask Ali to come and lead us in prayer. Let's pray. I don't know about you, but my heart feels quite full, just of love and affection and gratitude for the things that people have said about Margaret. Um, and perhaps more so, Lord, because they've pointed us towards your great tenderness and your love and affection for all of us. But just as you were faithful to Margaret in her life, even in the way that she died, you too will be faithful and full of love towards us. And I'm also going off script here, but I'm sure many of us have perhaps even been in this church to bid farewell to the great and the glorious and the good and the powerful, who we've loved, but, but in Margaret's life where there was so much suffering and fragility, um, 
yet we see Christ, and Lord God, and Lord, we thank you for that. Um, as it's been said over and over, we want to thank you for the boundaries that you set for Margaret's life. The boundaries of family and music, the love of animals, and her faith. We're so grateful for that family in Somerset East, and her years growing up in Port Elizabeth. We thank you, uh, Heather Warren said, um, I hope I've got this right, that you met Humphrey in the music shop when they were both choosing scores just because they loved by music I don't know what they were doing but that's when they first laid eyes upon one another and they were fated to be together and Lord we thank you so much for the amazing children that you gave Humphrey and Margaret and Mike and I had the privilege of in the little community, uh, committal service this week. I want to tell you that their children are absolutely delightful. All very, very different, bound together by great bonds of affection and a great sense of humour. And I was sitting behind them now, and John made quite a few comments about Margaret's hair. But well, I just think all these children have got the most remarkable hair, from John's wonderful the care to the girl's beautiful hair and Michael. Isn't that funny? We learn, we get so many things from our parents, Lord, and they got wonderful hair. And it just shows you, Lord, you are interested in the detail of our lives. And we thank you for these beautiful children who read uh, young girls who read the lesson to us, who too have been blessed with beautiful hair. I know it's a silly thing to say, Lord, but you are in the detail. But we pray for Donald and Sam, for Mike and Ellie far away in England, and my children, for Richard and Heather, Richard and Sam, Wendell, for their children, and for Karen, and for Charles. As they remember and celebrate their mother today, we pray for them. Their faithfulness and love for Mark, which is such an example to us all. As has been remembered the great times, yet they have supported and cared for her, especially in the young, long years since Humphrey's death. And we pray for all the grandchildren. How lucky they have been to have such a wonderful grandmother. And uh, we pray too that Margaret's legacy to them may also be the bonds of family, music the love of animals, and a strong faith. And Lord, uh, we pray for ourselves, as I'm sure for many of us here, um, at a funeral like this, we think of our own lives and our own lives and the things that we love, the works, memories for us. And Lord, we pray that all these memories would draw us to the source of all memory, that is you, Father, the one who loves us so dearly. Finally, Lord, in your great tenderness, you took Margaret to, to yourself in such a gentle way. Uh, we all know that you would have hated to have left her home, and, and yet, and you spared her that, Father. We thank you for the love of neighbours. We thank you for the gift of friendship in this room and so many people. We thank you for not only Margaret's service to this church, but her love for this church and the fact that you gave her this church as another family. And so, Lord, uh, we entrust this dear friend, mother and grandmother with much love and affection, knowing that she is totally safe and home with you. And we look forward to joining her in time. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to sing the hymn, How Great Thou Art.
this influence. outside and you'll be able to greet them. Hi, Carolyn. I can't have my glasses on. Connell, hi, Connell. Hi, all of you. Jean, everybody's on there. Thank you for making it. Pleasure. Hi, Jean. 